Next talk up, uh, intro to graffiti, virtual graffiti, and this is Tony Koff. Let's give her a big hand. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Like he said, I'm Totenkopf of the Neuronumerous Group, um, and today I will be talking to you about virtual graffiti. I originally wasn't going to submit this year or present a speech, but um, then Neon Rain and I got into a discussion about the growth of hacking electronic construction road signs, and then we uh, started talking about virtual graffiti in general and how outside of the graffiti research lab, there's really not a lot going on or a lot of information about it. Next thing I knew, I was cursing her name and submitting my CFP. So before I get into all of the nitty gritty details about virtual graffiti, we're gonna discuss what it is. All right. The most commonly used definition for virtual graffiti is that it involves the use of virtual objects and or digital messages, images, animations, etc., that are applied to or viewable from public locations. They can be viewable through electronic devices such as computers or mobile devices, <clears throat> but are quickly expanding beyond that and can be seen on digital billboards, road signs, and the side of buildings. I know that this sounds like a very large subject, and it is, so, uh, so much so that I have decided to break the speech up into four different parts. Uh, first, we'll cover the history of graffiti, uh, where we're going to discuss where it originated and how it got to the point where it is today. After that, we'll go over some examples where I'll be covering things that have been done for a little while and as well as some things that are shiny and new. And once I planted evil little ideas into your mind, <laughs> we're going to move on to legal concerns and government responses to graffiti. And finally, uh, who would be interested in this and why they should be interested in this. So now that we all know what virtual graffiti is, we have to recognize the fact that we wouldn't be able to do virtual graffiti if we didn't have regular graffiti first. <clears throat> um, but does anyone have a guess as to how long graffiti has been around? Come on. Oh, does it? <laughs> so this just gave up the fact that I didn't do my slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unfortunately, Toten Dad is the one who does all my slides, and Nikita yells at me every year to do my own damn slides, and this is why. Um, so yeah, 30,000 years ago, and started with cave paintings and pictographs that were uh, made out of animal bones and uh, pigments. The reason that I say arguably is because there's some debate as to whether or not uh, the cave drawings were really graffiti. Um, prehistoric graffiti was occasionally used in religious celebrations and in those instances were endorsed by society, which is contradictive uh, to the current day definition of graffiti. Although it's debatable whether the cave drawings are examples of early graffiti, we can definitely say that it was popular in ancient Greece. <laughs> Um, in fact, the first known example of Grecian graffiti is viewable in the ancient city of Ephesus, which is in uh, present-day Turkey. Uh, the first graffiti drawing was evidently an advertisement for prostitution and was etched into stone near mosaics and walkways. The image itself was of a heart-shaped handprint, kind of like that, a footprint, and a number. The heart-shaped handprint was meant to represent uh, love in exchange for money. And the footprint and number are believed to represent how far one would have to walk in order to receive these services. Similarly, the ancient Romans are known for carving graffiti on walls and monuments. Some examples include curses, magic spells, political slogans, declarations of love, alphabets, and literary quotes, all of which were preserved in Pompeii after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. There was also ancient Roman carvings that were made by young men to make themselves feel big, most of which can be found around at uh, gladiatorial academies, including one by Salatus, which states, uh, Suspirium Polarum Salatus Thrakes, or Salatus the Thracian makes the girls sigh. <laughs> Not to be outclassed by the Greeks, though. Um, the Romans were also known for using graffiti to advertise prostitution. In one area, you can find an address for a well-known prostitute named uh, Novelia Primigena of Nuceria. And uh, in another, you can find etchings of phalluses with mansueta tene, or in English, handle with care. 
scrawled next to it. There are other many uh, lesser known instances of pre-modern graffiti, uh, including but not limited to carvings on the walls of uh, royal and or wealthy homes in the Ma of Mayans in the site of Tikal in Guatemala. The Vikings left markings and etched their names into ruins in Rome, New Grange, Mound in uh, Ireland, and one Viking, Halvdan, put his names on runes on a banister in um, Constantinople. Constantinople. I can't pronounce it. I'm from America. We don't care about anything outside of America, really. Um, various Renaissance artists would travel to um, the... No. No. Yeah. Various Renaissance artists would travel to the ruins of Nero's Domus Aurora in order to carve or paint their names. French soldiers would carve their names on monuments during uh, the Napoleonic campaigns uh, in, um, in Egypt. And travelers along the Oregon Trail left their names at Signature Rock. Now, that is all of the pre-modern stuff. None of the techniques that were used back then to make the drawings and or carvings are used in modern day graffiti even though the messages and the thoughts and feelings behind them are the same as what's seen today. Uh, with that said, we are now moving on to history of modern day graffiti. Okay. <clears throat> In the 60s and 70s, graffiti started to gain popularity with political activists and gangs wanting to mark their territory and make themselves heard. Once it started to become more popular in places like New York City, Graffiti started to migrate from being out on the streets to the subway system. The main goal at that time was relatively simple, or simple, out tag and out bomb the other graffiti artists in the area. For those of you who don't know, bombing is used to refer to creating large, more elaborate pieces of graffiti art, usually done by uh, breaking into closed off areas like subway depots after work hours so that there is a lower chance of getting caught while you're drawing. <clears throat> also during this time, the use of designs such as polka dots, cross hatches, and checkers were becoming more popular. The use of spray paint increased um, in order to expand what the graffiti artists could do and how fast. And the appearance of top to bottoms, or works which span the entire height of a subway train, became more popular. The combination of all these innovations in graffiti has led to this period of time being referred to as the Golden Age. Unfortunately, the 80s became a time when it was increasingly harder to tag or bomb, especially in New York City, which was and still is considered to be the epicenter of the graffiti movement in the US. Um, some of the reasons why new pieces were getting rarer include the fact that the burgeoning drug, drug trade increased the amount of firearms out on the streets, making tooling around at night more difficult and dangerous. The police were able to dole out regular and more severe punishments to graffiti artists that they caught and store owners were forced to restrict their sales of spray paint. They weren't allowed to sell to people under 18, and they had to keep everything locked up in cages to uh, dissuade shoplifting. Um, and finally, the local transit authorities caused a lot of problems when they used the increase in their anti-graffiti budget to build new and better fences around train yards, hire more guards to patrol, and fund regular heavy buffing of train cars to keep them graffiti free. To the chagrin of uh, officials who thought that these measures would be enough to completely squash the movement, um, artists and, uh, and writers moved from underground trains back onto the streets as well as the top of buildings. <clears throat> After being relatively dormant in the 1990s, graffiti art has started to become active again in the past 10 years. Graffiti is being used by companies such as Sony and IBM as a way to break into guerrilla advertising, which is basically a buzzword for um, cheap and dirty ways to catch someone's eyes to buy your product or show interest in your company. Um, <clears throat> it is also becoming more popular in mainstream pop culture. It's showing up in video games like Jet Set Radio Future, Sony's Rakugaki Okaku series, Getting Up Contents Under Pressure, Super Mario Sunshine, Half-Life, and the Herbs, Sims, in the City. Even clothes designer Mark Echo uh, has publicly stated that graffiti art is without question the most powerful art movement in recent history and has been a driving inspiration throughout his career. 
<clears throat> now that we've gone through all that, it's time for the part of the speech that most of you came here for, and that's the examples of virtual graffiti. We're going to start off with the tried and true stuff, all of which has been either pioneered or popularized by the Graffiti Research Lab. And as a side note, um, the examples that I'm going to show you appear all on their website with a list of materials as well as instructions. And in this section, I will be going in order of least to most difficult to do. The first examples we're going to cover are the most popular and most common of virtual graffiti, and that's the LED throwy and floaty. They are really cheap and easy to make, especially when ordered in bulk from sites from uh, Deal Extreme. Uh, for either floaties or throwies, you'll need LEDs, an assortment of colors, and a uh, lithium battery and tape. If you're doing throwies, you'll need a magnet, obviously, because otherwise it won't stick to anything. You just look like a retard throwing LEDs. <laughs> or um, if you're doing floaties, you'll need balloons, otherwise they sink. Uh, next, we have the electrograph. It can be as easy or as difficult as you want to make it. Likewise, it can either be as relatively inexpensive or um, expensive as you wish to make it. Um, the base materials are pretty simple. Conductive paint, magnetic paint, regular and or spray paints, stencils in case you're not comfortable freehanding, LEDs, and batteries. From there, you can add various different components like microprocessors photos, or uh, photoresistors so that the LEDs only come on during night, or uh, even a proximity sensor so that it lights up or does something based on how close someone is to the art. <clears throat> the last example for the tried and true section is the Graffiti Research Lab's laser tag. The hardest part of this is acquiring the parts and setting it up at the site that you want to do this at. The materials that were listed on the GRL site for this project are a laptop, a 50,000 ANSI lumens uh, projector, a security astronomy camera with manual iris zoom lens, a magic arm with a super clamp, a PCTV USB capture card, and a 60 megawatt green laser. Uh, in some places, that's illegal, by the way. And um, also, don't shine it in animals or people's eyes because they'll go blind or really, really pissed off with you. Um, and you'll also need AAA batteries to power everything. Um, this setup can get pretty expensive, so it's worth looking around to pl at places like eBay, Craigslist, pawn shops. Um, or if you have lots of money, you can give some to me and I can go buy it new from the store. Um, next, we're going to do the shiny new stuff in, on the virtual graffiti front. Although in the last section I was able to go in order from easiest to hardest, um, I'm going to be going from least to most obscure. Each of these three examples are relatively new, with the first two having been successfully and publicly attempted. Uh, we're going to start off with electronic roadside construction signs. <laughs> so toward the middle or end of, I think it was 2007, 2008, uh, people in the US started to see uh, more and more examples of people hacking into these roadside construction signs. Um, there are probably several different manufacturers, but most of them use the same one, which is, um, well, no, wait, I'm just going to say it, ADCO, A-D-D-C-O. Um, <clears throat> those are the ones that are most commonly hacked because they're the easiest in, to hack because they're the least secure. Um, <clears throat> and these are also the ones that are mostly used by Department of Transportation. Um, the first example, well, yeah, the first examples of hack signs were just like this one that warned drivers about zombies being ahead. Uh, since then, there have been many other instances of these signs being hacked, saying various things like Harvard sucks in Massachusetts, no Latinos, no tacos in Miami, and the ever clever this sign has been hacked. <clears throat> in January of 2009, I hacked featured a post that gave readers step-by-step -step instructions on how to hack into these signs and change the message to display whatever we want them to. I am both pleased and chagrined to say that they're still very accurate, as in around 5 o'clock before I hopped on the plane, I was able to go try it. I didn't change anything because um, I'm a wimp, but <laughs> I was able to get into the sign and, prove, and see that the uh, console was still in there. Um.